Hi, I'm Brett Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. At times it seems like it will never end. The stream of shameful, slanderous, pseudoscientific research belched from the halls of academia and the darkened corridors of public health. With each new study, the same old rehash of claims chips away at the truth that vaping is a safe... No, 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 wait, wait, I'm talking about climate change. Uh, actually, maybe I'm talking about COVID-19. Really, guys, it, this all might be the same issue. That is the same crisis in science. So joining us today to help sort this out is Mark Morano. Morano is quite simply the world's number one climate contrarian, a dogged opponent of historical science and a denier of the prophecies of climate doom. He's the author of the best-selling 2018 book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, and the award-winning producer, writer, and host of the 2016 hit film, Climate Hustle, which rips the mask off global warming hype and exposes the myths and exaggerations behind the science propping up the science, the climate scare. Mark, thanks for joining us today on RegWatch. Thank you, Brett. I'm happy to be here. I am... Uh self-quarantine in my uh, basement here, much like, uh, not Andrew, but Chris Cuomo on CNN. Of course, I don't have the virus like he does, but I'm hunkered down here, obeying my, my stay-in-place, shelter-in-place uh, governor's command for the moment. Well, and you, well, you're in the heart of it where, where the real troubles are. And, you know, you are always are on the front lines of these things. You've been at, I mean, battling climate change now for many years. And before we jump down the rabbit hole, which is climate change, sure. and talk that, and then, of course, talk COVID, let's first start with how our paths crossed. It was last September 2019, just after the U.S. Centers for Disease Control launched its campaign to implicate nicotine vaping with the illness and death caused by what the CDC dubbed as an outbreak of new vaping-related lung illness. Considering our audience is keenly aware of issues around vaping, let's first start there. What do you know about vaping and the progressive battle to crush it? Well, interestingly enough, I didn't know anything about vaping. I mean, I just, I, I've always been a uh, pipe and cigar smoker, and I never inhaled. Uh, so I never smoked cigarettes. I have no, none of that history. I had seen a couple of the Sigalikes years ago. But in, actually, in the last year, I started getting the uh, e-pipes e and the uh, cork-tipped uh, vape cigars and really enjoyed them. I liked them because you could, you could vape in a car, you could vape in hotel rooms, you could vape, and you got great flavors, especially the e-pipes. I mean, I've, had, I've found e-pipes with naturally extracted tobacco that in many ways are more enjoyable than real pipes. Without the fussing, they glow red. You have all kinds of flavors like butter pecan, pistachio. Anyway, so I became quite passionate. Mark, I'm going to get you. Side. Mark, I'm going to get you to yeah. uh, just uh, pull your get a little more headroom there on your shot. Do you see that? Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just go ahead and adjust your camera there. Ah, your there seat. You that's just that's a good, <laughs> good way to do it. So you were just about to say. So let me put words to that. Are you know why are you passionate about vaping? Well, I just thought it was, a, was a, as a very awesome concept of harm reduction because I didn't smell. I, I, you know, I'm not inhaling anyway in my case. I know a lot of vapors inhale, but I was treating it the same way I would treat a cigar or pipe. So you could, again, there, it's, it, it's sort of complemented cigar and smoke. And I found myself way back, cutting way back on both any kind of real cigars and real e-pipes. So I'm like, wow, this is an amazing technology. So I actually then started buying uh, likes, I guess you'd call them, the ones that look like traditional cigarettes. And I was trying to give them to people who were smoking and telling them, hey, this is going to be much healthier uh, for you than a combustionable tobacco. Well, so I'm, I'm doing all that. And I'm also following the global warming you know, debate. So what ends up happening is I see the whole health scare start. And I, I, you know, I, when I get into an issue, I start looking at some of the, the regulatory side to see what's happening. When the health scare started last summer, I was very interested, not because you know, I was going to become a vaping lobbyist or because I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, anything like that. I've never had any involvement in tobacco, cigarettes, anything. People like to paint me as being a tobacco denier or anything. But what happened was I saw the same campaign cause from public health officials that I'd seen from United Nations scientists and uh, United Nations bureaucrats and officials and the climate campaigners. Immediately what we saw was this narrative that all of these guys in the white lab coats were claiming is that, you know, your teenager is at risk. And they were. A lot of teenagers were at risk. I'm not downplaying the lung outbreak. But the obvious thing about it, which was shocking to me, these were illegal black market vapes. It was pretty early, pretty clear early on that that was the cause. 
and to see the CDC, to see public health come out and just never bring that up and recommend no one vape, and then to see all the cities banning vaping while allowing cigarette smoke to still go on unfettered, and seeing whole countries, I believe it was India that banned it. It was just shocking to me, and it was all sort of this hysteria. So the other thing I would do is Check all the local news. If you want to see really bad media, I mean, we can laugh about CBS, NBC, and the mainstream media, but you want to see really crap, bullshit reporting at the lowest level, just check any random city across the United States local newscast and the stories they were doing, completely omitting black market, completely omitting uh, all the stuff, uh, all the um, facts that these were THC and black market with this additive that's not in any registered or monitored uh, e-juice. It was an amazing thing. So I realized right away what was going on, that the fix was in. And ultimately it led to the CDC, even long after the FDA acknowledged this, CDC holding firm. So the CDC plays politics. People out there need to realize they are a lobbying organization if there's nothing else. They are concerned about public health. There's a lot of good people there. The organization as a whole tries to do the right thing, but they are subject to this lobbying tendency where, again, no dissent is allowed, like we've seen in the climate debate, and no break in the narrative. And, it's, and it is a narrative, and the media just eats it up, and then you have all these different studies that come out, and they hype the – just like climate, an extreme scenario, extreme stat that becomes the headline without explanation. And we're seeing that now. We've seen it in climate change. We're also seeing it now in the uh, coronavirus uh, a mess here with even President Trump. I, you know, I couldn't watch the press conference last night with him saying over and over, I think it was 2.2 million. We've saved that many lives by doing this. They pick extreme scenarios of any study, and then they allow that to become you know, the, the, the mainstream pick. In other words, if, you know, I always use it in climate. I like to do the butterfly scientist. A butterfly scientist no one's paying attention to, so he starts doing research. He doesn't have journal publications. He's not in the media. So he does a study where he has three ranges of what could, might, may happen to butterflies 50 to 100 years from now. One is moderate, one is mild, and then one's this extreme scenario based on models. And that scenario then gets picked up. In fact, I've, t I've had scientists, and I feature in my book, they spend more time. This is not an anecdotal story. This is the reality, an actual documented they spend more time working on the press release for their scientific studies when it comes to climate than they did on the actual study. And I actually have the scientists admitting that in the book. So what happens is they get hype the press. Suddenly, butterflies are doomed based on the extreme outlier prediction uh, 100 years from now. Suddenly, they're getting book deals. They're getting published. They're getting media attention. They're getting funding. They're getting invited to Bali and Cancun and South America and all these you know, iconic UN uh, climate summit destinations. Well, the same thing's true in public health. The same thing's true uh, in, in the science world when it comes to you know, vaping or anything else. You cannot, you have to look at what's happening uh, behind the scenes. And I think President Eisenhower laid that out in 1959. Uh, actually, sorry, 1961, and he's leaving his farewell inaugural address when he warned of the scientific technological elite where a government contract is, is, essentially gives you the certainty that you can essentially become a unelected ruling class. And that's what I'm afraid we're seeing happen here, particularly with the coronavirus uh, and, of course, with everything I mentioned about vaping, that all led to a slew of legislation. Just to sum up on vaping, I'll have one last line. It was ironic to me that you would shut down legal vape shops all because of an illegal black market THC vape that people were buying off the street. So you did nothing to solve the real problem, but you made the, the actual legal safer product completely unattainable in many cases with outright bans. Well, combustible tobacco and cigarettes and other things completely went unfettered uh, in countries and in cities. It was just logic, science, everything turned on its head, all because of public health advocacy. So in the climate debate, they call it that, I don't think anybody on the, that side actually calls it a debate. They don't acknowledge a debate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't, right. So, but you know, on that issue, there's been a slew of science, obviously, over the last 20, 30 years, that really is just one-sided and comes down one way. And, um, Vaping seems to be the same case there. So when you, coming from your experience on, on the climate side, this is a, a science question now, not just technically a vaping one, is that, did you, did you see parallels there that kind of shocked you or surprised you? Or did you, or, or did you go, oh my God, it's the same 
same operation happening in terms of science. No, it was the, it was the same formula. Again, they they'd come up with a crisis. They would hype. We're talking about the lung ailment. You know, they would hype. Uh, the extreme scenarios of the kids dying in hospitals. And it was horrible and tragic, and absolutely the media needed to get the message out there. But once it was clear what was going on, you know, there was the absurd thing, and I think you covered this uh, here, but in Canada, where the doctors would be like, well, we have a patient here. We can't tell you whether it was an illegal THC. We're not going to tell you that. But if you contact us, we have a list of suppliers uh, that will, a list of companies that will tell you whether. You can give us a list and we'll tell you whether that was on what he bought. So they played like this cat and mouse game because they couldn't come out and say, no, we, these are black market illegal vapes. And then the media would not have been able to report it in the same way. Politicians would not have gotten the same message to regulate. So it's all about controlling the narrative. And the same thing is absolutely true of climate. You hype the extreme scenario. You, you, you downplay or hide the information that's not going to build your narrative. What I like to say, it's like a campaign. If you're a campaign spokesman running for a congressional district or some local office, you're only going to hype and allow the news that's favorable to your candidate, and you're going to quash and destroy anything else. The problem is this is done through government policy in you know, the white lab coat world, or the, and that includes both public health and uh, scientific world, particularly when it comes to climate change, and now even viruses. I mean, we're finding the doctors who were trying to dissent on this are just viciously attacked, marginalized even though there's some very prominent researchers from Stanford and everything else, basically saying, we don't know if the clampdown, government clampdown like we're doing is going to be a good thing. But let me just give some caveats here. This is a very serious virus. It, as bad as a severe flu or much worse, we don't even know that yet. People are absolutely dying. It's in a pandemic phase. No one wants to get it. It's spreading around. The issue that I think a lot of people have and one of my heroes on this is Peter Hitchens, uh, who writes in the UK, the brother of Christopher Hitchens, now deceased. But Peter Hitchens has been just phenomenal on this, basically saying that governments are surrendering their liberties in an afternoon to the, to the state of Big Brother, and that we're giving you know, decades-old liberties just overnight to this hysteria without any evidence that, A, it's as bad as they're claiming initially. Again, we're talking millions of deaths they claim, then they'd revise all these downward, then they say, well, that's because of the steps we took. There's no way to disprove or prove anything they're saying. So my problem is not that the virus isn't serious. It is, and all kinds of precautions should be taking place. I have a 96-year-old aunt who's in essentially quarantine at a uh, assisted living. I have a near 90-year-old mother who's uh, self-quarantined. There's all kinds of vulnerable populations that need to be protected here. But the question is, how far do we go for how long? And then there's a the whole flip side of this, of what you do on the other side, which is, you know, people losing their homes, their cars, their livelihoods, suicide, depression, family stress, their, I mean, uh, you know, prolonged economic depression. These are questions that are legitimate to ask, but at this point in the media, there's just absolute sort of conformity in the mainstream media on this. And, you know, I'm not even saying I have an answer to that, but I'm saying these are legitimate questions. Like, you know, they, I go back to the Peter Hitchens line, surrendering our centuries old liberties in an afternoon because of a virus scare. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty powerful to see what's happening here. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this uh, had been set up for some time. You could call it a conspiracy, or you can just talk about it how we would hear at RegWatch, which is the way dominant hegemic ideologies work. And the progressive ideology is now become the dominant hegemic ideology of the day, meaning the people that are inside and believing the ideology do not know they believe in something. It's been naturalized, uh, yeah, and so... Same. Same thing with the media. They don't believe they're progressive. Uh, Steve Malloy, who runs JunkScience.com, wrote a book you know, on, uh, recently on the EPA. He had a great line. He said he knows of no conservative libertarians who go into public health anymore. He said it's the equivalent of not knowing any conservative teachers who go into teaching anymore because you're going to be so outnumbered. Your, any views you have are going to be crushed, and it's become the purview of the progressive left in many ways. I'm not talking about the actual doctors in this case. I'm talking about the, the sort of the bureaucracy in public health. And so what it becomes down is it becomes a self-interested lobbying organization where no dissent is allowed. For instance, the World Health Organization in 2018 just posted tonight on my website, Climate Depot, called climate change the greatest threat facing the world in the 21st century 
officially, bar none, the greatest, not one of, but the greatest threat in 2018. And now the World Health Organization, of course, has singing a different tune, and, and rightly so. I mean, obviously, the virus, this coronavirus, COVID-19, is significantly and radically a threat. But the idea that, uh, that the uh, World Health Organization is the trusted World Health is outrageous. They've done so many crap promotion of these climate change health studies and even the psychiatric stuff. You know, you have so much stuff in the realm of health when it comes to climate where they claim, you know, it's going to cause increase in depression. And they go beyond this. It's going to cause vehicle theft increases, rape increases. I mean, the wackiness, which with which with which these uh, studies go is just mind boggling. But this is the world in which we're faced. And if you dissent on this, you're labeled a denier. Your career is over. Uh, there's a, ca a Canadian scientist, Dr. Dennis Rancourt, who's uh, featured in my film, Climate Hustle. Uh, University of Ottawa, I believe. He, ta he talked, it's actually fascinating stuff. He was a professor who basically didn't want to, I, was from, I, don't, I hope I'm not <laughs> misinterpreting this or misrelaying it, but he didn't want to give out grades to his students, got at odds with the administration, ended up leaving his professorship. Uh, over this because the students, he said that the, the, the current university system is training obedient intellectuals who will never question anything. It's not about learning. It's not about keeping an open mind. It's about being an obedient intellectual that's going to essentially serve at the pleasure of the powers that be in the state. And that's what he was protesting against. He's had a whole series of videos and highlighting reports and analysis on the whole COVID-19. So I defer to uh, scientific experts on this. Uh, and there's many of them. In fact, uh, I believe people have been collecting all the, all the people who think not that this isn't a serious threat, but that our reaction to it is, A, not helping and may actually be more harmful. And some of the things that can be more harmful, old people who are, need to get out and get fresh air to get walk around, they're now being homebound. A lot of times with not even having caretakers check on them. You're going to have massive depression, which leads to heart attack. You're going to have people who are losing mobility as this continues to go months you know, in Virginia, we're on lockdown until uh, early June right now, allegedly. Uh, and so what they're doing is you're not allowed to leave your house. You're going to have the potential of some places have police roadblocks set up. D.C.'s offer, you know, warning of $1,500 fines to keep you locked up in your house. Uh, they're closing beaches. Now, I can understand party beaches or people MTV style college break. But a beach where you could actually limit the number of people, a beach gives you vitamin D, sunshine, a healthy air. Why keep people cooped up in the time of a pandemic virus inside? And then some of the absurd things I'm seeing are people walking out, you know, wide out in the open with masks on, with no one within eight football fields of them. That doesn't seem to make much sense to me. I can understand wearing a mask if you're going in a store uh, or somewhere in close contact. But government does rely on hysteria. It's how you get obedience and I think this virus scare, and we can talk about this in a minute, is unbelievable. The climate activists must be grieving because they tried for decades to get government to do all the things that happened virtually overnight in this virus, coronavirus uh, situation. And now the uh, climate people are like, what did we do wrong? How did we miss this boat? So let me ask you, Mark, um, make the case for why our viewers should be skeptical about climate change. Okay, so let's we'll, we'll back up here. Okay, basically, climate change, uh, in, the eight, in the 1890s, we had a scientist in Sweden who talked about the greenhouse effect. And so what you'll hear people like former Secretary of State John Kerry say, this is, you know, 19th century settled physics and about high school physics, and there's no doubt. What he's saying is that carbon dioxide can have a warming effect on the atmosphere. And they turn that, settled physics, if you will, into uh, we're going to face a climate emergency, a climate crisis. The earth is going to heat up three degrees. We need a U.N. treaty. We need a Green New Deal. We need carbon taxes. We need regulations. We need every aspect of our lives centrally planned based on that. Now, as we went forward to the 20th century, we had the global cooling scare in the 1970s. People like Stephen Snyder uh, and, NASA, other NASA, and, and NASA scientists literally said, yeah, there's a warming effect from CO2, but... Carbon-based uh, fuels, i.e. fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, were creating aerosols, which were essentially blocking out sunlight. And this was a greater effect, and this was going to cause a global cooling. And we're already overdue for the next ice age. So in the 1970s, you had a slew of reports, including CIA reports and others, warning of this essentially global dimming, global cooling effect, to the point where they wanted to put soot on the Arctic, 
uh, to, to stop, uh, to, to help the ice melt so it wouldn't freeze up too much. They blamed hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts on global, man-made global cooling at the time. Uh, and interestingly enough, they actually wanted the same solutions that we're hearing about today. There was like primitive Green New Deal. They wanted wealth redistribution. They wanted international treaties. They wanted um, all sorts of restrictions on the economy and, and uh, energy at the time to stop global cooling. So you fast forward, by the late 70s, you had scientists on both sides, and New York Times actually reporting on this, you know, that we were battling between global cooling, climate, global cooling climatologists versus the global warming meteorologists, and they had this big battle. And actually, Freeman Dyson, who just died, uh, the, the successor to Einstein at Princeton University, was on the, glo- the non-global warming side. He wasn't really on the global cooling side. But he talked about how they lost that battle, and he says it was because of funding. Now, this was interesting because the other side got the funding for the modeling studies, and that essentially set the, paved the way for global warming. So by 1980s, uh, Al Gore, I believe, had his first global warming hearing in 2004, if you will. They called it the greenhouse effect back in the U.S. Senate. Maybe it was a congressman, but it was back around 2004. By 2000, uh, by, I'm sorry, not 2000, 1984, sorry. And by, by uh, two, 1988, you had NASA's James Hansen come out, testify to Congress. It was also the same year the U.N. put their climate panel together. And this is where it all gets, the science gets truly bastardized when it comes to climate. Keep in mind. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, but there's literally hundreds of factors that influence the climate. CO2 is but one. You can't, at the margins, manipulate one factor, carbon dioxide, and then expect to have any outcome like they're claiming. Like we're going to have, you know, we had Senator Chuck Schumer on the floor of the United States Senate. Everyone knows that if we'd done more on climate with these hurricanes wouldn't be as severe. They actually believe that they could have passed a carbon tax 10 years ago and we'd have less hurricanes. Obama administration was famous for these claims. We need the EPA climate regulations because the storms are getting worse, but yet they never subject them to a cost-benefit analysis because they wouldn't even affect global CO2, let alone global temperature, if you believe CO2 controls the temperature. So by 1988, once the UN gets involved, you basically have a self-interested lobbying organization that has to find carbon dioxide is the control knob of the climate causing dangerous climate change, or they cease to have a reason to exist. Now, in the case of the UN, not only do the scientists get to have a panel where they can manipulate the data and, and actually have the summaries signed off for by United Nations delegates, bureaucrats, and world leaders, and that's the actual truth there, and they admit this. Only like 52 scientists sign off on this central claim of CO2 essentially controlling, being the control knob, and those have to be agreed to in the summary with the politicians and bureaucrats of elect, and elected officials. So what happens is the UN is in charge of the science, They can't find it's not a problem of CO2 because they cease to have a reason to exist. And this is the cream of the crop. Not only are they in charge of hyping the problem scientifically, but they're also in charge of solving it policy-wise. So you get a double self-interested organization, the science side of the UN and the policy side. And, of course, the policy side began with the abominable uh, Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which Republican George H.W. Bush went and committed the United States to, and the Senate passed in 1993, ratified the treaty. And essentially that led to the creation of these UN climate conferences and the Kyoto Protocol and the Copenhagen, and now, of course, the Paris Climate Agreement. And so the United Nations, completely vested, self-interested lobbying organization, uh, has had their opportunity to, uh, by the way, thinking of clips, if you want to show a clip, have me testifying in the, in the United States Congress against the former U.N. climate chief. Uh, they gave me about seven minutes uh, of video, and they actually shut me down. The Democrat chair had to shut me down. And this, the hearing was so successful from a climate skeptic's point of view. This was last uh, spring. Mm-hmm. I was there with, with uh, Patrick Moore, Greenpeace co-founder, and he and I went up literally against five of the other side. And the, the left even did analysis. We had Patrick Moore and I had more speaking time. It was such a route for the other side in terms of us exposing the agenda as the UN Climate Species Report that they quietly, three weeks after that, announced a new herring with the same United Nations officials that had to fly in back into the United States to do one this time without any dissenting guests on Capitol Hill because they didn't get their hearing because there was split media, there was controversy, they hated it. The UN 
uh, former chiefs, they were livid, angry about it. So they came back, redid the show, and then they finally had their you know show without dissent. That's what they want, no dissent. So anyway, so, to take a long look, story short, climate is not controlled by CO2. My movie has that. I did a report of a 1,000 dissenting scientists many years ago proving this. I have a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Give me the foreword uh, in my book or as a blurb in the book. Uh, it is a it is an amazing thing to see. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, that was reissued last year with a whole bonus chapter on the Green New Deal and updated. So anyone who wants to get that, is, it's available on Amazon. You can actually see the template for why the coronavirus is such a threat to our liberty right now, because the same playbook applies. Never let a crisis go to waste. And in the climate world, that is a hurricane, a tornado, a flood drought. Just let me finish on climate. One more blurb here and I'll be finished. Everything from Polar bears, which are at or near historic population highs. And this is one of the cons they'll do. It's much worse than we thought for polar bears. How? They're at record population. They never counted this many. Well, our prediction of 50 to 100 years is much more dire for polar bears. So when current reality fails to alarm, what they do is misdirect and make scarier and scarier predictions of the future. And that you see time and time again. But if you're talking Floods, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes is either no trend or declining trends on climate timescales 30 years, 50 years or more. And that's actually in the United Nations climate reports. It's buried in the reports. You can cite the U.N. to debunk climate fears, but it's not in the U.N. summary for policymakers. It's not in the U.N. lead spokesman scientists, people like Michael Oppenheimer, who come out. He got hundreds of thousands of dollars, more than a quarter million, maybe more than a half million from Barbara Streisand when he worked for the EDF, Environmental Defense Fund. And these are scientists that are peddled out as having no skin in the game. You have the President Trump allows the uh, National Climate Assessment, and the media loves to say, Trump's own scientist uh, even said Trump was wrong on climate change. These are reports that have been authored by the federal government since authorized since the Clinton administration. And what happened was the Union of Concerned Scientists, a progressive left-wing uh, environmental group, has scientists in charge of this federal report who've hijacked it. And guess who coordinated it? None other than Obama's lead coordinator for the United Nations UN Paris uh, negotiation, Andrew Light. So that's who Trump's own scientists are. It goes through the Trump administration, already pre-started, like when he starts his administration. This is reports coming out. Uh, no one in Trump's administration will speak ill against it because they don't want to be called, accused of censorship by the New York Times. So my point is this is how the sausage is made. They do these reports. There's no dissent allowed. I have a whole chapter in my book on former U.N. scientists who turned against the organization. U.N. officials, U.N. scientists actually on record as saying, and I have the quotes, will make the next U.N. climate report so alarming the world will have to act. That's using science to lobby for political goals. And that's essentially all you need. People always say, you're not a scientist. Aha, but I play one on TV. I can buy a white lab coat just like anyone else. No, I'm not a scientist. My background is political science from George Mason University in Virginia. But that's so, all well, let me, you let need me interrupt, let me interrupt there. Let me interrupt there, Mark, because, because you're making some great points. So I want to I make sure that I'm connecting some things for our viewers. Sure. First of all, is that is a great point. Science is corrupted. But people who think that this, if you agree with that statement, you may think that that's a recent thing, but it is not. The concept, so whenever you hear somebody say, I trust the science, you hear this all the time from progressives yes. uh, during all of this whole thing. I trust the science. It's evidence-based. I trust science. Um, it's the science. What about the science? Science! Yeah. Right? So they completely lost what they don't know. For the ones that do that, you know, are practicing, you know, sophistry and stuff like that, they know. Um, but they can, they're taking something that is a process uh, that is designed to be doubtful, always and skeptical, always at the front, and then with a hypothesis that you go in and you try to disprove. So you're not actually supposed to be trying to prove your point that you're going into the experiment with. You're supposed to have a hypothesis and do everything you can to disprove it. And that's the null hypothesis that every right. statistician knows, every true, every scientist knows. It's the basic thing. And your method is the method in which you create that experiment, the hypothesis, the experiment, you conduct it, you, you know, measure, you measure it, and then you do your analysis of it. And, and that is the scientific method. And coming out of that, it should be something that resembles some form of truth right, at least in terms of that particular science in, in, in its isolation. And then all of the other scientists out there then grab it and then try to replicate it 
uh, again, trying to disprove it. And if they can't, then the truth hardens around it. The problem is, is that science is a truth-making process. And what the postmodern progressives have done here in a Machiavellian, deliberate way is, is change the, that meaning of science without redefining it to the end public. The end public still sees the output of it as truth uh, while they change the actual process in there because they've corrupted it all along the way. They've corrupted it with the, the presuppositions going in. They've corrupted it with the hypotheses going in. And then in the whole process, they don't respect the data. They pick and choose from their data. They, you know, they decide what to put in their models. And then when stuff, stuff comes out that they don't like, they bury the study or, or, or they bury the conclusions deep down. But the press release right. up at the front uh, still is claiming alarm and hysteria. And that's exactly what the United Nations has done. Michael Mann, the Penn State professor uh, who came up with the infamous hockey sticker, which uh, it's the hockey hockey stick, which shows the northern hemisphere temperatures basically steady to the 20th century skyrocketing. You know, Steve McIntyre and uh, Ross McKittrick, these two researchers in Canada, reached out to Michael Mann basically, and he didn't want to release the data to that study, and there was no way to replicate it. But it was used in all the UN reports, all hype. And then I have a whole chapter in my book just on that. Even Michael Mann's fellow United Nations climate activist scientists were all saying they didn't believe it. They were skeptical of it. Uh, and then what's, what ends up happening is it doesn't really matter about the details. It becomes the iconic image used for lobbying and PR purposes. Um, and it, you're absolutely right. The scientific method is lost here. I just gave you a stat earlier about, you know, Literally empirical data, even in United Nations reports, even in the report I referenced about Union of Concerned Scientists, a national climate assessment, have to admit that extreme weather is not increasing. So how do you get around that? Uh, so what they end up doing is they look at a storm like Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Katrina a few years back, and they'll say, this storm was you know, X amount more powerful due to climate change based upon our modeling studies and blah, blah, blah. So instead of actually looking at the fact that, A, hurricanes aren't getting uh, more frequent, more powerful, the 1940s had the, you know, some of the worst, most powerful hurricanes that we know of, the, the, the accumulated cyclonic uh, activity, the, the ACE me measurement, which they do for hurricanes, is showing that this is not the case, that there's a climate signal in it. On time scales, and these are again, these are all there. But what they do is they do these weird models. I'll say weird because they they basically torture the data. So they'll say, well, because of climate change and our added CO2 in the atmosphere, we've made events like this tornado outbreak, you know, five times more likely by this year. And so then the media will report extreme weather getting worse when in reality it's not. Or in the case of these climate groups that try to co-opt TV weathermen, they'll say. You know, since 1970, as a baseline, our local city has increased this much in temperature. If this trend continues, we're going to be up this high by whatever. Why are they picking 1970 as a baseline? Because that was the, one of the coldest years of the 20th century during the global cooling scare. If they had picked the 1930s as a baseline, in many cases, they'd be showing declining temperature or flat temperatures or a slight increase, depending on your location in the continental U.S. So... They've got the science, and what they've done is essentially everything is caused by climate change. So if you want to talk about falsifiable science, which Karl Popper, the, you know, the scientific philosopher, would go into, you cannot prove or disprove this. When they claim now that global warming will mean less snow, except, uh-oh, we have blizzards, record snow in the East Coast, and then suddenly Al Gore does a thing, this is what we're seeing, global warming means more snow, it's heavier, you know, more blizzards because of this. And then they'll, they'll basically claim both outcomes. So in my book, I have a whole section on global warming causes, more hurricanes, less hurricanes, more malaria, less malaria, more fog, less fog, saltier seas, less salty seas, more colorful foliage, less colorful footage will shorten the time of day, lengthen the time of day. They literally have predicted every outcome. This is their climate science, which you can't question, or they threaten to put you in jail. And by the way, I have that in the book, in the movie, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. went to jail, climate deniers. Bill Nye, the science guy, in quotes, thinks it's a great idea and we should look into it. He's not opposed to jailing climate deniers. And, um, but if you don't agree that climate change can cause opposite results, then you're a denier. And so the problem is there's no way to falsify this theory. If they say global warming means children won't know what snow is, which is what they've said, and suddenly you're getting record snow, and then they say global warming means record blizzards and snow, 
where can you go to say, okay, how do we falsify your theory? Because no matter what happens, that it fits their theory, and that's why it ceased to become a science. That's why your audience, Brent, should be skeptical. Well, that is uh, that is disturbing. That's all I could say. Let me. Uh, we're going to go to a clip that I've got from a uh, video that I did. Uh, Regwatch did in the summer of 2017. We had uh, Dr. Robert Spencer on. He's from NASA, uh, and uh, literally the man in charge of the Aqua satellite system, right? That that monitors and measures the ice caps um, and sea levels uh, for NASA at the North and South Pole and obviously the oceans around the world. And, you know, at that at that time, he was he was clear he called himself a lukewarmer. But that's because all these scientists are being forced to, like, you know, right. basically do that. But I mean, he outright said there is no uh, global warming. I mean, it's it's not there. You can't differentiate uh, uh, any kind of warming that might be seen really from you know you know he was committing heresy really actually pretty much but before yeah. we before we went into that interview i've got a, just a, a two minute clip here of where i was outlining to vapors the connection between vaping and climate change the key reason why i want to play this is because those connections are the same connections that we see at regwatch with what's happening today with covid uh and it's definitely worth it and it'll take us into the next part of our conversation here so most are called skeptics or deniers, despite the fact that doubt is the starting point of all genuine scientific inquiry. There are two operating principles at work here, which are hostile to sound science, yet power the anti-vaping and pro-climate change movements. The first is a Machiavellian precept, the end justifies the means. That is, a virtuous outcome excuses any wrongs committed to attain it. For climate change, almost every policy and action is justified by this precept, including the deliberate manipulation of climate science and the unrelenting propaganda spewed from the mainstream media. Skewed science and biased media is of no surprise to vapors, which have the climate change movement to thank for breaking down the firewalls, protecting journalism and scientific integrity. Specifically to vaping, the end justifies the means, provides the support to ban flavors. While the goal to protect the kids is righteous, it's also indifferent to the outcome, which puts the immediate health of adult vapors at risk. The second operating principle at work is called the precautionary principle. It was born from the environmental movement and codified in direct partnership with public health at the Wing Spread Conference in 1998, held in the state of Wisconsin. It's now law in the European Union and lies at the heart of every international agreement on climate change. The precautionary principle states, when an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken, even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. This means a policy may be enacted to prohibit or restrict an activity, even if there is no scientific proof it causes harm. The only prerequisite is scientific uncertainty and a suspicion of risk. Precautionary principle is really the smoking gun that links the tactics of the climate change movement with those of the anti-vaping movement. How often have vapors heard, we just don't know enough about the risks of vaping, therefore to be safe than sorry, let's enact regulations to hinder or even ban vaping altogether. You've got to give credit where credit is due. Activists insist on the one hand that the science is settled on climate change, yet on the other, they insist scientific proof of cause and effect is a necessary thanks to the precautionary principle. They've really boxed civilization in from both ends. And if this sounds a little political, well, that's because it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and Very it's true. Very well said there. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I really have time to, you know, script it out and then a couple of days of editing. But that's like really the key thing here is that people don't understand that there is a policy that was developed in partnership between environmentalism and public health. Those, how, why are those two together? Because they're together. Because public health is a progressive movement. Progressivism is public health. You, there's no daylight there. And same with environmentalism. Yeah. It's progressivism. It is. Now, you know, there's always been a, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt conservationist has always, you know, and that's what people don't understand. They think that anyone who is against modern left-wing environmental, progressive environmentalism is not for the environment. Uh, you know, I grew up 
loving the environment. I actually grew up, you know, watching those documentaries on the Amazon rainforest and, and, and all the trees being cut, how many football fields a minute. I ended up doing a documentary. It was eye-opening. Uh, I went down to Brazil several times, and I did a documentary uh, that was released about 20 years ago called Amazon Rainforest Clear-Cutting the Mist. And the New York Times came around on my side. Essentially, it was the most intact forest for every acre cut. Now, you know, 1.50 acres were being regenerated. So this whole concept of uh, the idea that, Amer- that humans in modern life is destructive to the planet, and then they put up the indigenous populations. In fact, I interviewed the author of a book, Robert Whalen, uh, called The Myth of the Eco-Savage. And he talks about how the indigenous people would run, uh, run animals into extinction, uh, de- deforest, cause fires, but yet they're considered part of Earth, whereas modern man, because we use fossil fuels, we're the invader, we're the... Uh, you know, the, uh, the parasite. and the We're the virus. The We're the virus. We're the virus. Yes. Yeah. And that, by the way, there's some, been some people happy about this virus on the extreme end, you know, that this is going to, you know, cull the herd, if you will, of humans. That's how anti-human these are. And that's what Patrick Moore says. The modern environmental movement uh, is essentially an anti-human movement. And why? Now, I could cite the work of climate researcher Bjorn Lomborg, who, using the precautionary principle concepts, he debunks all this. In other words, The U.N. Paris Agreement was estimated to be the most expensive treaty in world history. Uh, And I believe the number was, I want to say 100 trillion now, but I don't have that. I may not have the exact number that he estimated. But the that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah. If we use that money to actually help with development and getting energy access to the developing world, over one billion people don't have running water and electricity. I mean, this is like you want to talk about doing less harm and helping people. You go in right now, one of the biggest threats are people burning huts, uh, burning dung in their huts. They're polluting their local rivers. You bring in fossil fuels. The third world, which is politically incorrect to say, but the developing world actually improves because they're not using, uh, they're not clear cutting the forests and uh, they're not burning dung. They're better air quality. They're not dumping, uh, you know, their waste into the local river. They they build infrastructure. They get modern medicine. It's one of the most pro-human things you can do. But we have instances where the World Bank, the Obama administration was stopping development in places like Africa because of climate concerns. We can't let them develop the same way. And this is where it gets really weird in the whole climate debate. In fact, the first movie, we, we, in, in the second film too, we have Al Gore warning that there's essentially going to be too many Africans on the planet. He says that Africa will have more people than China and India combined by mid-century. We need ubiquitous fertility management. Would President Trump get away with saying there's going to be too many Africans and we need to figure out a way to limit their number? Uh, Now, Gore said this at a Bill Gates-funded event. It was at a Bill Gates uh, conference. This is the kind of stuff we're seeing. Paul Ehrlich, a hero to the climate community, a hero to the environmentalists, the author of The Population Bomb, wanted to put, suggested putting forced sterilization agents in the drinking water to keep the population down in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. That's the base of what the climate movement is springing from. And, you know, to go a little bit further, like uh, the precautionary principle with, with climate, is, it's an amazing thing because they want to shut down all of human history. We have United Nations officials on record, the climate chief, Christina Figueres, on record essentially saying that we seek a centralized transformation that will make life on planet Earth very different. So because they think a one to three degree temperature is going to be cataclysmic 100 years plus from now, that we need to make people's lives now strictly under permanent government control with limits on transportation, development, your home appliances, your home thermostat settings, the kind of car you drive. We had Democratic candidates recently based, again, on the precautionary principle of we must stop this harm from coming in the future. We don't exactly know how bad, but they're on the safe side. We need to ban the the uh, auto personal ownership of automobiles. One of the Democratic candidates running in the U.S. suggested a roving fleet of electric cars instead. This is, of course, not even mentioning the fact that electric cars 
I think it's 70 percent of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which the mines are run by Chinese company, which Amnesty International is claiming there's child um, uh, child, <laughs> child labor abuse is going on. So there's, there's all that going on as well. But but essentially, we have Elizabeth Warren, another Democrat candidate, wanted to essentially ban home building unless it passed sustainability requirements. So you couldn't build a new home unless it was sustainable based on essentially UN guidelines, precautionary principles. So this is just infecting every aspect of our life before the coronavirus came. Right. And so, so to be clear on the precautionary principle, it's enshrined in EU law. Yeah. So it, it, the European Union has enshrined it. So it, it's a must, it must be considered for, for all development of regulations and approach policy and everything else. It's enshrined in Canada. It's not enshrined in the U.S., but it's uh, considered. I think that's the right way to put it. It's recognized, but it's not enshrined. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what the key thing about it that is so insidious is that it's in the absence of scientific evidence. So when there is yes. no evidence of harm, but there is a belief by the experts, the technocrats, the, as uh, Tucker would say, the professional class, right? If they believe that there's a harm or can sell the hysteria that there's a harm, then you can, then you can take the action. And, and that's exactly what drives all climate change, because none right. of the science stands up. In fact, when they say that the majority of warming was caused by, you know, humans, that's an expert judgment, which, you know, in the words of Lord Moncton, the former Thatcher advisor, is a show of hands of basically U.N. experts who say, because of this, we're projecting, you know, the majority of the warming is caused by humans. Therefore, it's going to be X, Y, Z. So that projection then means that we have to pre take precautions as a society and shut down essentially life as we know it. And that includes meat eating. The UN climate chief has now said that, you know, we, we need to banish meat eaters the way we banish smokers to their own section in restaurants, uh, that we need to make meat eating as expensive as possible. Al Gore timed his public IPO of the Beyond uh, Burger to uh, the big UN climate, the UN meat eating report, agriculture report that came out. Uh, and it was one of the biggest IPOs. And my question is, is Al Gore's quest to become a, uh, a, a fake meat billionaire because he's promoting the, you know, these uh, burgers, which actually nutritionists say aren't healthy, but it's all based on the climate scare. So we have to change everything now. I remember John Stossel, uh, who's, by the way, going to be in my sequel, Climate Hustle 2. Uh, you can go to climatehustle2.com. We had scheduled for April this year, but of course, Corona shut all the theaters indefinitely, so we're planning it for the fall. But John Stossel, years ago, when he was at ABC, did a segment, essentially, which was a precautionary principle concept of if the bicycle were introduced today, based on our current environmental and safety and health regulations, you know, given how many kids it has killed and given uh, the, the amount of injuries it causes, they probably never would have been approved. This would have been seen as the most dangerous uh, uh, invention in the history of, of childhood inventions, and it would have been banned right off the fa face. No one would have been, ever been willing to take the risk. But thank God, thankfully, it was done before the great nanny state took over our society and tried to regulate every aspect of our lives. And it's only getting worse here because – with Climate, our sequel, by the way, the first movie you mentioned, uh, Brent, that was Climate Hustle 1. That came out in 2016. That deals mostly with the science. And nothing's really changed. Some of the stats may be different, but the gist of it is the same. We go through all the scientific method, the extreme weather. I compared it to witchcraft. There's a whole section in the first film, which basically, and it goes to, there's actually scholarly studies that show that accusations of witchcraft increased during the, the Little Ice Age uh, in Europe. When, when uh, crops failed, economic hardship, bad weather, uh, illness increased, and they blamed it on witches. And so now with climate change, essentially this is, you know, this is akin to blaming bad weather on witchcraft. They're blaming it on our SUVs. They're blaming it on our thermostat settings. They're blaming it on fracking, you know, this hurricane, that tornado. We really have not advanced scientifically since, the, since that time. But our sequel deals with the UN climate agenda. Climate Hustle 2, which will be at theaters this fall. You can go to climatehustle2.com to read more about it. Kevin Sorbo, the actor, is in it. In this film, we go in great detail of what's behind the agenda. We go behind the scenes of the Green New Deal, which, by the way, the architects, two of the architects admit it is not a climate thing. It is about a change the economy type of thing. 
We have the United Nations climate officials admitting that this is the climate, the climate treaties that we talk about, the uh, Copenhagen, Paris, are not about the climate at all. They're about redistribution of wealth. They're not even related to climate. They admit that openly. So you quickly realize that climate science is actually climate lobbying, and it's not about the science. It's not about the climate. It's not about the environment. This is about essentially uh, controlling the economies and central planning, and this is what the progressive left bureaucrats dream of. Never let a crisis go to waste. And that's what we're seeing with this coronavirus crisis. They're not letting it go to waste. They are jumping on this with unbelievable – the climate activists, and I have a whole bunch. The former UN climate chief actually said that this could be a good thing because emissions are going to be down. There will be less commerce, less trade. Other people are looking at this and saying this is exactly the model we want to follow for the climate emergency. So, um, yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. And so we're going to just quickly uh, pop over to um, Reg Watch here for a second and uh, take a look at this. All right. So two things, Mark, I'm going to just walk people through here so you can, I would say, have sure. a vape. You, this would be the time I'd say to a guest, have a vape. You, you're right. off camera. <laughs> Um, I don't want to promote bad habits. It's still a bad habit. You know, I don't want, <laughs> yeah, no, no. it's to, harm reduction. So. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, sorry, I want to, look, I want to do this. This is what I want to do because, you know, quite frankly, everyone's going to just sit back for a minute and a half. You too, Mark. This is a series of uh, little quotes that I've taken from James Burnham's book, The Managerial Revolution, which was written in 1941. This is 1941, folks. And so let me just rip the scab right off of this. This is fascism that we're seeing fully flourish here in the West. That's how they were able to completely do what they've done because fascists are bureaucrats or managers. That's kind of a little bit of a debate here. But no matter what, it's totalitarian. It's total. The whole thing is total. And if you just spent a second thinking about the progressive ideology and just think about your life and how you're surrounded by a total narrative. That narrative is total, right? And you dare think past it, you are toasted, right? This is, this is totalitarianism. And so what we're seeing here is the implementation of the direct control of the individual. And I'm sorry, but we're living in martial law here. If you're not recognizing that and you're going, oh, what about Italy? What about Italy? Oh my God, Italy! Yeah, that's hysterical. You're hysterical. This is James Burnham, 1941. Russia, Germany, and Italy, which have advanced furthest towards the managerial society, social structure, are all of them at present totalitarian dictatorships. And when you hear dictatorship, you've been programmed out there, folks, for the leader. And everyone, you know, the left was calling Trump a dictator, dictator. Dictators do not uh, gut reg regulations. That's the first thing. You want to know if you've got a dictator that's running your country? They're not the ones gutting all the regulations. That's yeah, opposite dictator, right? Others have been as severe within the limited realms of social life to which the dictator extended. In our situation and in the others, there's no one single dictator. Lenin's strong, sure. Hitler's less strong, sure. But it takes the entire population and, and this cadre of managers and bureaucrats, the, the, tech, the technical class. What distinguishes totalitarian dictatorships is the number of facets of life subject to the impact of dictatorial rule. What distinguishes totalitarian dictatorships is the number of facets of life subject. So when you're thinking coronavirus, I mean, it's already right down to when I'm grocery shopping, you know, I'm forced to stand six feet away. You know, even in my own condo building, they've got barriers up now and tapes and anybody who sticks a sticker on a public or a private business's uh, floor designed to stop you from moving, that's fascism. And uh, this, so I'm unconvinced that uh, this COVID thing is anywhere near uh, uh, yeah. the kind of disaster that makes this kind of stuff happen. And it's only gonna grow worse until April 30th, and then who knows after that. It is not merely political well. actions in the narrow sense that are involved. Nearly every side of life, business and art and science and education and religion and recreation and morality 
are not merely influenced, but directly subjected to the virus regime, to the public health regime. So totalitarianism presupposes the development of modern technology, especially of rapid communication and transportation. Without these latter, no government, no matter what its intentions, would have, would have had at its disposal the physical means for coordinating so intimately so many aspects of life. Without rapid transportation and communication, it was comparatively easy for men to keep many of their activities or even their entire lives out of the reach of the government. This is no longer possible, no longer possible or possible only to a much smaller degree when governments today make deliberate use of, po of the possibilities of modern technology. We're almost done. Totalitarianism is so striking a feature of the present social transition that it seems to many persons to define the character of the transition. They tell us that the issue is totalitarianism versus democracy. This is 1941, remember, a time when actually uh, yeah. people were talking about these things, right? Let me just scoot through here. Everyone has such powerful feelings, such acute moral opinions for or against totalitarianism that scientific understanding is gravely hindered. It is legitimate to believe that there is often an element of hypocrisy or illusion in these findings. And what kind of lies, cruelty, terrorism, brutality are after all normal, not exceptional ingredients of human history for the purposes of our analysis, for the clarification of our central problem. So he's saying in 1941, the central problem of the Western world is between totalitarianism and democracy. And now there you go. The managerial society, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Supreme Planning Commission. Uh, it, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this gets all oh. into, I mean, exactly everything that's happening here. There is not going to be a single aspect of the Western world that does not get touched by public health or, or, or virus planning. It is all going to be, t is all touched already. Well, let me say, first of all, two points on this. Um, in my film, Climate Hustle 2, we have a running theme, <clears throat> excuse me, a running theme comparing the climate agenda, which is essentially the bureaucratic state's agenda, to 1984. And we have liberal use, under fair use, of course, clips of the 19, uh, Edmund O'Brien, I think 1950s uh, version of the uh, George Orwell classic 1984. And it's eerie how many parallels there are to this agenda. The idea that you're always fighting this enemy, that you have to be in wartime. Have we heard, you know, this is the greatest threat. Uh, you know, they talk about climate change being the greatest national security threat. We need a climate wartime president. The enemy uh, is essentially unseen, but everyone's got a sacrifice. And the, there's clips in the movie where they have to turn the lights out at a certain time. They have the, the movie where they have the kids turning in the adults for, quote, suspicious behavior. Uh, so we parallel all of that. And then, of course, we show the modern kids under with Greta Thunberg and these whole kids that you know, we had them testify here on Capitol Hill last September. And they're essentially saying mom and dad trashed the planet, their generation. Thanks, mom and dad. And we have to fix it. It's pitting generations against older, younger generation against older generation. So the 1984 totalitarian state was strived for in the climate world. Now, I'm going to talk about Vaclav Klaus in a minute, the former Czech president. But before I get there, just, the just want to say one thing. Let me let me just. Sure. What was that last point you just made? You just that very. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. So they they blame the old people for wrecking the yeah. world in their future, yet they are destroying Western civilization to save eighty five year olds with pre like with cancer. Uh, yes. Well, that's you're now you're getting into the virus. So the the thing about the virus is the the climate activists, and I have. If you go to Climate Depot, you'll see, unbelievable, there is a lust by the climate activists to basically scratching their heads. How in the hell did they, the public health, pass us by overnight and get everything we wanted times 100? And they're still trying to figure it out. So they're, they're trying to decide. They're, they're taking notes. They're trying to piggyback climate onto it. We now have the United Nations claiming that, you know, viruses – um, are going to be worse with global warming because of it, even though I, in fact, in my, in my presentations and in my book, I show you that they claim you know, all these different viruses are going to be more because of it, less because of it. All the studies contradict each other. So, again, if, if you're betting on a big Super Bowl or, or a sporting event, if you bet for both teams to win, you can always claim you were right and you picked the winner. That's what the climate activists are doing. But 
they, it's so shocking how fast this is. You know, think about this. Last fall, the biggest thing was flight shaming. You had uh, you had um, uh, Greta Thunberg taking expensive, you know, carbon fiber plastic yachts across the Atlantic, even though the crew had to fly back and forth in airplanes. Hey, the image was great because she was in a yacht, uh, you know, going on the Atlantic and not flying. So you had all the flight shaming going on, and now what's happened? Flights are grounded. Again, climate activists' wildest dreams come true. So they're trying to piggyback on this, and they're going to try to keep people in this wartime state. The scary thing about this virus is we already know from big public health in Washington, D.C., that they're going to talk about multiple layers of clamping down. So that even if they sort of, you know, we're going to be on Stockholm syndrome, we're going to be so grateful that our captors, public health and the, and the government and these governors that put us into self-quarantine and shut down all aspects of human society – We'll be so grateful for any loosening that we'll just be like, oh, my gosh, thank you, thank you. And then they're going to tighten down again when they see fit and tighten down two, three, four times in the future. They're talking about never relinquishing this kind of control. So the question then becomes, Brent, will the public, will the masses, as the bureaucracy likes to refer to people, be willing, be willing to accept this kind of government control over a virus into the future? Yeah, I and can't the, answer that. I and no, no, it's tough to know because seriously, th this is so bad that the kind of uh, pushback has to meet. You have to meet force with equal force in some yeah. manner or another. And you can't. You can't really oppose the government, though. What are we going to do? I like the. I hear people buying guns. Are we really going to have a shootout between National Guard troops and state police and people barricaded because they want to go out, you know, to the local park? I don't know if that's going to happen. But this is, you know, this is a. This is unprecedented territory for the modern era. And people like to point back to, oh, well, we can't have what happened in 1918. Well, if you look back at 1918, you had uh, you know, overcrowded you know, troops training in the South or, or Midwest going over in trench warfare, uh, fighting in a war without any, you know, you know, in horrible conditions in the trenches. And, and then they come home and then tenement housings where three families are living. You have a rapid spread, poor health care. If you, if you look at World War II, I can't remember what percent of the recruits in World War II didn't even pass the physical because they were malnourished. So imagine 30 years before that, you had a generally less healthy population stuffed into uh, in a, a very record cold winter, if I recall, during the 1918 when they were training the troops, well, 1970 probably, training troops to go over to fight World War I. So then they were forced into these little tents with the heaters. The virus spread. Then they had overcrowded field hospitals. Then they sent the virus over to the trenches. So then it spread. And to think that that is applicable to modern society, we have so many tools. There were, they didn't even have complete quarantines then. They did in certain places and locations with varying degrees of success. But that's, we have a modern society now where we can protect the vulnerable. There's many other options we can take here. But the fact that Anthony Fauci can go on TV and just say, well, you know, a complete clampdown. He's talking as he's an unelected leader who's now in charge of everything, and just at his whim, we can shut down human civilization. This is a scary time we've entered. But to, to finish on this point, well, go ahead. If you want, I, well, I, I, was, I mean, I was just going to say, on, on the precautionary principle, I mean, uh, both Fauci and what's uh, Deborah, Dr. Deborah, whatever her last name is, uh, they, uh, yeah, they said both many times, they said, well, you know, in the end, there's just so much we don't know about this virus. And that's yeah. exactly why you don't shut down Western civilization. But because they think precautionary principle and public health believes it's their job uh, to prevent disease uh, instead of, you know, managing, you know, yeah. instead of dealing with, you know, you no government in this world can protect a population from a virus. Well, it's like the speed limit debates. I remember we had the 55 mile an hour speed. If it saves one life, it's worth it. And, you know, you had Wyoming, Montana, all these wide open places. States wanted to be able to set it here in the United States. Well, why not set the speed limit at 15? How many lives would you save? If your only concern is saving human life, let's have a 15 mile an hour national speed limit. Now, you're in Canada, so people are probably trying to do conversions here. But, but this is part of the, the, just the, the nonsense. And so people like the CDC right now, the people that Trump has entrusted, they're not looking at the whole picture. They're not, they're not experts in the whole picture. They're not looking at the economic side. They're not looking at the mental health side. They're not looking at the physical side of, of the quarantine. They're not looking at the long-term effects of a prolonged depression where people are going to be losing their homes. And, uh, and, and they're not looking at the effect on health care, on technological religion, on people's coverage. I mean, this is just a 
devastating upending of society for this virus. And again, the climate activists are lusting after how successful this was. Right. But on the same thing, I mentioned 1984. I just want to make sure I mention this. In the film and in my book, I, I, I flew to Czech Republic to interview Vaclav Klaus, the former president of the Czech Republic. He was part of the part of the resistance against the Eastern Bloc communist uh, takeover by the Soviet Union after World War II. He was a leading academy, ac I always mention that, a Len Murphy Academy, and he was essentially banned from teaching because of his heretical views against the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. It sounds, and we draw the parallels to what's happened to the climate scientists who dissent. They lose their careers. They get, they, they lose their funding. They lose their stature. They lose professorships. They get fired. It's unbelievable. Well, Vaclav Klaus actually said the greatest threat we face from individual liberty is what he would call the, um, the ambitious environmentalism in the face of the climate movement. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, that's the greatest threat we face. Well, I would add to what Vaclav Klaus is saying, the greatest threat now we face are, is the using of viruses now to, to get our civil liberty, because now that they have this unprecedented steps in place on, on global level, and there's a few places not experimenting. I believe Sweden and a couple other places are actually going to sort of let the virus spread and see how the economy and people absorb it. Um, but we'll be able to have, so hopefully we'll have some comparisons so we can do test traces. But, but this is pretty scary. You know, viral fears is going to be the new catchphrase because this is not going to go away when anyone in power. And I leave you with this. I'll, well, here's what I would say. If Hillary Clinton had won and beaten Donald Trump in 2016 and Trump was running again, and this was an election year, and Trump was the nominee, would he accept Hillary Clinton? deferring to public health and shutting down the entire United States economy? I don't know. Would Republicans in general accept that? I don't know, because I think this is a weird time where Trump did not want to do this. He was sort of, he ended up reluctantly doing it. And because he did it, all of the you know, commentators and uh, uh, Republicans essentially went along with it. It's also led to unprecedented World War II level debts in the United States. Here's a mockery for you, Brent. Brent, we had a Tea Party election in 2010 based on Obama's $900 trillion, $900, I'm sorry, billion yep. dollar stimulus, which included all the green stimuluses, the, uh, which led to you know, all the, the, the failures, Solyndra and all the solar failures and all the other things Obama did. It goes to a lot of Democratic donors and also the Obamacare health care plan. But anyway, we had a Tea Party class elected. These were not politicians. They beat establishment Republicans. There was all this fire and verve. But basically, Trump carried that same fervor to, uh, to election. This vote on the $2 trillion first of three likely stimuluses was only opposed, from what I understand, one congressman who was a Tea Party congressman. Everyone else, including the Tea Party leftovers, who all voted for it. So because of this virus, because of the shutdown, because of this now, we have uh, essentially put ourselves in untenable debt for as far as the eye can see. And the congressman's great line was, why don't we just have a three hundred and fifty? um well, I can't remember the number now, whatever bailout, then we could each give each American $1 million, and then we would be, we would be able to solve this. So this is what's happened is it, it's, it's indebted us now financially, crippled us economically, altered our lives in a way. And, you know, young people now are going to defer to the government. These are people being raised to like, yes, sir. Oh, the governor said we can't leave our house. My own kids are asking me, dad, are we allowed to go outside? I mean, these are you know, young kids asking this, but this is the question. Whoever thought we'd live in an age, Brent, where, where people would ask you, are we allowed to go outside legally? Are we going to be arrested? So, uh, well, <laughs> I've actually darkly yeah, actually, yeah, I kind of figured something like this was going to happen. You take one look at certainly since 2014 uh, and just the, the sheer hysteria uh, coming out of the progressives uh, and growing every day. That no, I, I'm. I, there wasn't a single ounce of me that was surprised. Maybe about how soon? I thought it might have happened how, after how Trump got reelected. I thought it might have happened yeah. after Trump got, got reelected, but nevertheless, though the, it's not surprising. Um, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, this is pure communism, and and I think that people here in the West need to start to get reacquainted with what the dangers of communism looks like. It's not just yeah, simple simply owning the tools of production, it's social justice is a communist uh, mantra. That's you, kind of where it comes from. And it's a Marxist, socialist, Lenin dogma. And the concept of empathy in which our kids have been taught now for two generations 
is also rooted in communism. It is a it is a a process where you're not allowed to make any distinctions. You're trained to put yourself in somebody else's oppression. Because remember, Marxism, socialism, and communism is the oppressor narrative. That's where it comes from. Where does all this oppressor narrative come from? It comes from communism. <laughs> it's just right there. Yeah, so, the yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, you, you're saving me for my show by interrupting, of course, right? No, no, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that Vaclav Paz said the exact thing. He actually linked environmentalism and the climate activists with everything he'd been fighting for. He said it's the same message. And I interviewed a Czech uh, member of parliament from the EU who said, this is incredible. As we become free from the shackles of Eastern Bloc communism, we are now having the same um, forces or the similar forces coming now from above, coming from the EU, these dictates on environmental climate mandates. So essentially, uh, Vaclav Plaza actually says they are masterminding from above. That, that's no, what they, he yeah. sees this as. Yeah. And that's, uh, that quote stuck with me because that's what they're doing. And they don't think free people should be allowed free choices and everything. And that's what this is so great. When you can have a police roadblock for them, it's so great. Where are you going? We're having reports in England and, and even the U.S., people being pulled over, being shown the ID. Are you really going out for something essential? Where are you headed? They're threatening fines in D.C. of $1,500. I mean, this is the hallmark of a totalitarian state. I don't care about a virus. I don't care about an emergency or wartime. This is not the America that we want. And this is an America that should be as temporary as possible. I do have a lot of faith and hope in Donald Trump. You want to see, here's a prediction, Brent. President Trump is not going to obviously kowtow to public health for much longer. He can't. He is going to break because he is not going to allow the economy to continue to tank endlessly the way the public health. Public health is never going to loosen the grip. There is going to be a split between public health and Donald Trump. Yep. When that happens, they're already talking about Democrat impeachment. That's going to be of Donald Trump a second time for failing to take public health seriously enough, number one. And number two charge is going to be for splitting with public health and trying to reopen the economy. There's no way this, can, there's no way this relationship between President Trump and public, big public health is going to end amicably. It's no, going to be I, an ugly I, divorce. I agree. Ugly divorce is coming. There's, there's <laughs> plenty... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty. Well, there's plenty of good people in public health. That is no doubt. But but we've said since, well, since Scott Gottlieb got up there uh, in September of 2018 and announced there's an epidemic of teen vaping and that opposed clear and unpresent, you know, present danger. The, I said it then. I've been saying it till I'm blue in the face. Is that those are the terms that public health uses to institute quarantines to stop people uh, from moving from one place to the next. And so, and then for, for that to go for 12 months and then for CDC to use the pretext of uh, what is a tainted product scare to basically run, which was uh, the narrative campaign of COVID. So the entire campaign process and tweaking up the media and the every single day, new dramatic announcements of new cases of vaping related lung illness, new cases of vaping related deaths day after day after day after day for yeah. six months. I'm sorry, but this is the same people, the same organization. They're lying to you like crazy. If you're a vapor and you are questioning COVID, shame on you. Yeah, let's just hope this, you know, let's just hope, let's hope that this COVID thing is nowhere near as bad as they've claimed. And we start to see the death tolls decline and we can start lifting. And then once we're through this, you know, this oppressive lockdown, we can actually start debating the merits. And hopefully President Trump and America and a lot of other world leaders will have a different perspective and we could go forward in a way that makes sense. I mean, you think about it, the bureaucratic state has prevented. In fact, uh, Fauci himself, I, I remember being at events back um, in the late 80s, early 90s with the ACT UP uh, AIDS activists would scream, you know, Fauci is a liar, CDC. They were so mad at him for not, I guess, not allowing enough vaccines quicker or treatment That's for right. AIDS patients. That's right. So there, he's been at war. In fact, there's an article out about how progressives have had a major problems with Fauci's whole career. But, but I think everyone's falling in line now on the progressive side because this is, again, this is, they don't like free people being free to do what they do. They think they're harming the environment, they're harming the planet, and the more they can control the free movement of human being that's what you know this is Václav Klaus message this is in their DNA it this is. is what they want and they wait for the crisis to come whether it's climate whether it's a bad storm or whether it's a virus 
uh, or whether it's teens dying uh, from this vaping illness, and they you know go and they 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 pounce. Uh, I, and again, there's always kernels of truth in what they're doing. Sure. Obviously, the virus is bad. Obviously, the teenagers were needed to be warned not to buy the you know these vapes, and especially the black market THC vapes. And teenagers shouldn't be vaping in the first place. But they turn that way beyond anything that's uh, you know from the original cause, and that's where the crisis mentality comes in. And again. AOC, Ocasio Cortez, and President Obama all saying they wanted that wartime footing on climate. Well, they got the wartime footing now on the virus, and we see what they're doing with it. And they want they are not going to give up wartime footing anytime soon. We've already been greatly damaged because the precedent's been set now. Oh, un- unbelievably, presidents. yeah. And I loved your point about President Trump, Brent. A, a president is not essentially a fascist or authoritarian who comes in and starts deregulating. President Trump was like the greatest deregulator. I think he exceeded even Ronald Reagan's 1981, you know, year uh, in terms of deregulation or at least rivaled it. That's not what dictators and fascists do. It's the other way. So it scares you to think of the next. And by the way, I'll make a prediction. If Andrew Cuomo is not the Democratic nominee, then the Democratic Party has no clue. I, I can't even believe Joe Biden is still you know, on the ticket at this point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying I like Andrew Cuomo, but he's their media darling and he would do much better. I just can't imagine Biden is going to be nominated against Trump at this point. So and I agree with you on that. I, I want to make sure that uh, the two things, one, I'm going to make a, a point and then we're going to go to a website here that I want to show you. Um, the sure. first one is that progressives desperately seek the moral equivalence of war. They take every issue, no matter how small, medium or large, right? And they turn it into the moral equivalent of war. And that's why it's all the issues. Well, how could they be war so on crazy? Drugs, war on obesity, war on whatever, just fill in the blank. Yeah. War, on, war on plastic straws. Like how could plastic yeah. straws? Yeah. yeah, because it's a moral equivalence of war. So the virus presents obviously because human beings on this planet there's only a couple of things that guarantee to kill us, bacteria and virus. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, virus and disease are politics. There are, they're the, it's the oldest politics. A couple of points I'm going to make is crazy because, you know, one of the things is that the very people that say, uh, that blame uh, Western white civilization for coming in and killing all of the natives with your disease, right? They, they, they're, they're, they're so whacked over this disease that the position doesn't seem right to me, right? Like, they, they, I think that they're going to be okay with a certain amount of disease killing. It's just, when is it going to be the right people? That's my, my deepest, darkest thing with these people is that they are fine with people dying. It's just got to be the right people. But wait, <laughs> it's my yeah. show, so I risk uh, getting taken off the air. So this is interesting. This is the American Public Health Association. It's a 120, 150 year old organization. I think 1880, I think is when it started. And so this is the professional organization for public health. And well, what do they do? Well, I mean, almost the majority of their stuff is all advocacy for non-public health related issues in my mind. Their, their thing is for science. Mm-hmm for action and that's the fascist word there and then for health great they got health at the end public health has got health at the end and then if you go into their facts sheet so this is their main sheet with all of their facts look at that look at how many climate change fact sheets they have yes. so yeah, it's completely co-opted the public health also psychological health interesting there the, all this stuff about climate change is going to bring you depressed climate change is going to uh, cause all sorts of psychiatric disorders. I mean, some of it's just so laughable. Al Gore types all this. Anything they could tie to, because this is all about, okay, we didn't really get into funding on this stuff, but funding is what rules the day. So that, you know, if, if, if you don't, if you're a scientist and you're not hyping global warming in your area, you are just not getting funding. You're not getting attention. It's that whole premise. And now, are you kidding me? Viral research is going to go through the roof. And maybe that's a good thing. I haven't studied it. I don't know how much they get now. But the problem is, it's going to be a race to fear, a race of to who can scare you the most, who can get the most dramatic headlines, who, who the media is going to tout. And the media is only going to be interested in scary scenarios of billions dying from new mutations. That's what's going to get the lion's share of the funding, if you ask me. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's corrupted. Uh, I mean, the focus that they have, the public health has, 
um, on activism around climate change is immense. And, and it's not just climate change. Let me just swing back here. It's not just cl climate change. If you go to Public Health Canada, uh, it's all diversity, inclusivity, and equity. And so why yeah. are our public health organizations, yeah. right down to training at the college level, infested with these communist ideas? These are, that, these are not public health ideas. They are, well, I mean, I mean, they definitely are poisonous ideas. And so I wonder, you know, um, if part of the treatment that's happened here in, in such a blanket application of uh, lockdown is not done because we have to meet equity guidelines. So they can't be seen, or and it's against their religion, right, to treat any one group differently. So if they were to treat, you know, healthier people right. of the higher class, you know, so forth in, in an area where there's not right, likely everyone. going to be any virus, you can't treat them different than the poor people down there because they're on top of each other and you really got to get them to follow. So to get them to follow, everybody has to get locked down. And it's the same thing too. They kick everybody out of school and all this telelearning, all this telelearning, three or four days later, all of a sudden New York Times, oops, nobody can get any grades because if you grade one person, and the other person doesn't have access to the computer, then that per it's not equitable. So nobody gets grades, and then all the kids are losing six, seven months of, of education, but they're still being told again right now, telelearning, telelearning, yeah. they're going to school. But meanwhile, no grades because of equity. Absolutely, uh, some of the benefits could be the, uh, you know, the higher education could take a major hit here, more telecommuting, more, um, I'm sorry, online schools, it's just, you know, this is one of the benefits potentially of the lockdown. Also, hopefully the FDA will start fast tracking drugs much more to the, to the market and you know, lessening uh, all the barriers that have happened. We're hopefully seeing that, especially with President Trump as president. But ultimately, this is a, um, you know, I, I, I did some research on the 2013, if you remember, the Boston Marathon bomber. And what happened was, I can't remember the governor's name now at the time, but they were looking for one lone bomber in the entire city of Boston. And they told everyone to shelter in place and no one could move. And they shut the entire city down while police searched for one gunman. I believe the police didn't even end up finding him. It was a guy who found him hiding somewhere, a private citizen. But the idea that a city like Boston would be shut down because of one lone uh, bomber loose somewhere in the city that no one could move and had to shelter in a place. I just said, you know, it's it's that we deserve totalitarianism. It's we deserve this if we are willing to serve our masters without dissent. And no one really complained about it. I remember screaming at the time. I can't believe a city is allowed and able to do that, and I can't believe the population is accepting it. But this is the age in which we live. It's always been that battle. You went through the nineteen was a nineteen forty one uh, excerpt there. The 20th century was the age where we thought we would have learned about you know, the, greatest, uh, uh, the greatest threat to freedom has been governments. The greatest killer of people has been governments, not viruses, not climate. Uh, and the 20th century taught us that. You think that would be our lesson. Uh, I don't know that it is. I am just really, you know, I feel like President Trump has been badly misled on this clampdown and to the extent of it. Uh, and I'm hoping he recovers. Uh, but I'm just not, you know, as of seeing what happened to the Tea Party and just, you know, they, we, they had success, they get elected and then they just fizzle out and, you know, nothing matters from what, what they voted for and allowing us and more stimulus coming. I just, the, the debt bombs this is causing, there's, there's nothing really good about this other than it should be a warning never to let it happen again. But the problem is we're already in stage here for second, third continued government clampdowns as needed now for new mutations of the virus. You'll always have that. So they have an instant crisis anytime they want. Scientists discovers new mutation. We are looking at another lockdown, quarantine. This, so we had to shut down this travel. And by the way, have you noticed emissions are down? And, and by the way, the planned recession, folks, a whole group of people, your audience probably never even heard of, the degrowth movement. And I've interviewed these guys at UN Climate Summit, people like Kevin Anderson. They, they stopped showering in order to fight global warming. They believe in planned recessions to fight global warming. Uh, and this has now made the mainstream. You know, the mainstream media is just reporting on this this week. And I did a, lot, I did a whole report at Climate Depot. I think it's still my headline. Uh, but the gist of it is the climate activists and the, you know, and the people who believe in you know, that there's too much economic growth and prosperity want to have 
planned recessions in order to lower emissions and fight climate change and to help you know a more equitable and just earth essentially part of social justice and now they're getting that with this virus. So it's another example of how the climate, how this virus has been piggybacking on the efforts of the climate activists. Yeah. And I mean, that that's true. And they are going to, uh, they're going to get their way, I think. And the last yeah, thing I want to, pr- yeah, well, let me right. just point out, let me just point out one, <laughs> one thing here too, because it's not just the climate. Uh, first thing in my mind that, that happens with this is the realization that once you create this kind of instability, once you re- remove people's power, individual sovereignty, um, then, and for those that do that, i.e., you know, the power that's operating here, I don't want to just say it's public health, but there's a deep state that's operating here that is yeah, at a global level, right? What we have is an opportunity, obviously, for Antifa. And for all of the radical groups that, you know, were quite happy to be starting fights and and doing what they've been doing forever, and they were just doing it moments ago. So to think that they're not planning right now is crazy. So we've got we've got a, a herd out there that is just dulled uh, in into fear or what or empathy, one of the or a combination of fear and empathy. And uh, they're focusing all their attention on you know, any people that might be considered a contrarian to the, to part of the narrative. I don't want to, I don't deny the virus. I, 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 and I, I actually, I don't deny anything. I'm just pointing out what's going on. What's going on is opportunism yeah. that leads to totalitarianism. That's going to lead to many more deaths uh, than what this little measly virus can do, because I understand human history and I know what the human being is capable of. And so once some of the darker forces decide that they're going to uh, destable our society even further. That's the real concern. I want to know why no reporter has been asking President Trump what's in his daily uh, security briefing. That's a question that should have been asked every single day since this thing started. No one's talking about what he's seeing in his security briefings. I'd like to know. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. And this is... uh... You know, again, they're going to do the impeachment based on President Trump not taking enough action. One of my favorites was Joe Scarborough at MSNBC, MSNBC who was uh, yeah, who apparently never even mentioned the virus on his show until months later. But he's saying President Trump should have known about it. This is one of those things that reminds me back at 9-11 where you're constantly getting warnings. Like, I love that people send out the tweet, Bill Gates warned of this in 2014. Who couldn't warn us? They've been warning about this since the Spanish flu in 1918. And long before that, the Middle Ages plague, people have always warned of viruses. This is the kind of like the climate con thing again, where many bad things will happen because of global warming. And then what, guess what? When something bad happens, we warned you, we predicted it. It's like going to a fortune teller on the boardwalk. You will have many trials and hard times in your life. And then when you have setbacks, you know, that fortune teller was a genius. She predicted it. Who can People are actually impressed that Bill Gates predicted a global pandemic years ago. As, there's always a chance this could happen. It's inevitable that it's going to repeat and it's going to happen again and again. Some of my favorite are the, the coronavirus will stick around. It's going to stick around like the cold virus and the flu virus. It's going to become part of all the other viruses humans have to deal with. You can't have a war against a virus in that sense. You're not going to eradicate it. But there's so many other things to think of. And right now, it's this madness that's descended upon Washington and all these governors. I'd like to just see one governor, and maybe your viewers know it or maybe someone can see it, who's reluctantly imposing this lockdown. I'd love to see someone say, it is so easy to exert power as a member of the, of the government, the executive branch who controls the state police and has all this power and authority and National Guard. I reluctantly do this. I don't like to see government. No one's even done it. They do it with lust in their hearts. They do it with, with vigor and excitement, and the media loves it. They love to see the governors in action, shutting down their states, threatening the people. How dare you go out here? We had the mayor, Louisville mayor in Kentucky calling people names, you know, bad names that you can't print, uh, you know, being basically calling them morons and idiots for going out and not obeying the order, and then other people cheering them on, thinking it's great. These are people in power that represent force. Government does one thing very well, force. 
We shouldn't be cheering on government exercising unbridled force. And that's exactly what the media is doing right now and what these governors. I'd like to see the reluctant you know, leader you know, hesitant to use force. That's what our founding fathers would have uh, liked to see, not what we're seeing now. Absolutely. Let me uh, just do it. We're going to wrap it up here um, shortly, but I want to make sure that we get a chance to do a couple of things. First of all, I got to do a little bit of business here and remind sure. everybody that, of course, <laughs> we are supported by you, the great viewer. And with millions and millions of people filing for unemployment in the U.S., well, once you start getting some of that money from the government, send it over to RegWatch's way. That's I mean, that's just really honestly, because. Until there's more people like us helping to fight the government, which I guess can only happen with words because any other way would be just a nightmare, um, you definitely got to give us a hand because we're at the bottom of the trough here. So, uh, But we're still doing good. Demand Vape, obviously, is uh, our anchor supporter in the U.S. And right there with us, John Glauser, rock solid. And many of our supporters are still doing what they can to help. And some have had to drop off, and that's just the way it is. So we've been hurt, but we are still here, and we are not going anywhere. So go to support.regulatorwatch.com and kick in a few bucks. Mark, so can you can you leave uh, the audience with any kind of hope? Because I can't. No, we're screwed. <laughs> um, gosh, hope. Well, I feel like an idiot. Brand. I used to go, yeah, I'm sure my critics will love that. But I used to go around and warn the Green New Deal, the UN Paris Agreement, it's going to cause central planning. It's going to cost the economy. That's going to affect this. It's going to take away your liberties. They want central planning. That all went out the window in about four days with the coronavirus. All my warnings at a level that no one agrees. So I'm still adjusting to that. You know, I've been warning about everyone about the climate. You know, the climate change con and how they were using it had nothing to do with climate. And this was all about centralized planning. And then meanwhile, a virus slips up and basically takes their playbook on steroids. Uh, and so to give you hope, I'm hoping, keep in mind, right now the government has everyone on isolation. So it's very easy. It's very hard for the public to start dissenting what's happening here. We're not meeting in town halls. We're not, you know, if you think of all the old movies, people, social movements, social justice, even, they all require meetings against the you know, the old Soviet system. You had the secret meetings against the Vichy France in, 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 during Nazi occupation. You had the secret meetings. No one can even have a secret meeting now. You can't even get together to talk to get your neighbor's opinion of this. We're all just afraid of the virus and hunkering down. So I'm hoping when this clears and people can start like coming out of the post-traumatic stress disorder that we're going to be in as a nation and as a public, that people will start questioning this and saying, wait a minute, you know, viruses are going to be infinite. Mutations are going to be infinite. Fear is going to be infinite. We can't allow this to happen again. That's my hope. But I don't know if it's going to happen. I just see people as growing increasingly like sheep, people not caring about liberty, people choosing security over liberty, and whether we have good Wi-Fi during the lockdown. That seems to be the biggest concern. So I don't know. I'm doing my part by going out every day. I'm going out, leaving the house. I'm running. I'm going to my office. Um, and I look forward to the day that I, I run into the police roadblock because it'll be my chance to do my chance of civil disobedience. So I was thinking the we'll exact same happens. thing yesterday. <laughs> the exact same thing. I cannot yeah. wait for the first time I get stopped and, and I, I refuse to clear an area. Well, we'll be in jail. And that's, you know, that's where they've always wanted us, uh, Brent. You know, the Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Bill Nye, the science guy, UN officials, they, they've always wanted to jail the dissidents. And, and talking to Vaclav Claus and Czech Republic there's a long history of jailing dissidents, and uh, you know that's not going to change uh, with because they're getting in the way. And it's quite funny because the same people that say that climate deniers, in quotes, have gotten in the way. You know, people like uh, Tom Friedman, New York Times, who wrote, you know, the Chinese government is much better on climate. They don't have to. They can just do what's needed to secure the environment without having to worry about any roadblocks. Yeah, one party rule is fantastic, and that's really what they want. They want one party rule. They don't want the set. And right now, unfortunately, in the United States, President Trump is giving them one party rule as the executive branch is in lockstep with public health. As I say, that public divorce is going to be spectacular and ugly. It will be. Happens. And it, it has to happen. It will yeah. happen. You've heard it here. I don't know when. It might be three weeks. It might be a month. I'd say within 60 days it'll happen. But I just I, can't imagine 
I can't imagine Anthony Fauci saying, yes, it's okay to open the economy now. They might say, yes, we can slowly, you know, let off the collar. And we're going to, again, Stockholm Syndrome, where we end up loving our captors. We're going to be so grateful. Do we can leave the house up to 50 yards? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Master Fauci. So I actually tweeted out totalitarian in chief. Anthony Fauci at one point, just because of the cavalier attitude he had about, well, we're going to shut down everything and then we'll keep shutting it down. Who is this guy? We didn't elect him to anything. You know, he, so this is... Um, well, I mean, you I nailed know, it. Yeah. Hope, I don't know. The hope is people get pissed off. That's the only hope we that's, have. That's the but hope. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know. In this day, you, keep in mind... They're trying to dope us all. You know, legal marijuana is legal everywhere, but, you know, they're, they're trying to ban vaping. And you know, I'm talking about actual marijuana everywhere. The, the idea of a compliance subdued public is fantastic for these politicians. It's not an accident that every CBS sitcom promotes, you know, marijuana usually in some way, as in some casual way. This is what the, the, the um, it's sort of the, the public way. They want us a subdued, calm public that's not going to resist and what a better way than making sure that marijuana dispensaries are available at just about everywhere now i, I mean i totally agree with you uh i mean I'm, I'm, I'm against decriminalization legalization I'm just yeah that's right push. yeah totally yeah. i mean you can be for marijuana you can be for decriminalization I've, and never everything done else. It. I've never even tried it i've never not any inhaled i never even had it i never tried marijuana never interested in it in a moment in a moment ever not once Neither have I, but I live in uh, the province of British Columbia, so there's a contact high just living here, that's for sure. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm making no comment, but let me just say this. So I've said it on the show many times, always be suspicious of a government that prefers its citizens to be stoned. If the government prefers yes, that, then... Yes, there you go. Yeah, that's the thing. So, well, look, Mark, uh, we're going to have to get you back on the show at another time because literally we could keep going. But first, let me just thank you for coming and, and you know, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, the books, Plaything, Correct Guide to Climate, Cl Climate Depot, and ClimateHustle2.com. You can watch the trailers. More on that later. We're, again, we're, we've been delayed to the fall at this point, waiting for all this to clear. Hopefully, hopefully our masters uh, uh, will allow us to resume normal life at some point. By the way, in Sweden, movie theaters are still open as of tonight. They're, Unreal. They're I, I already know. I already know the 60 minutes piece on that that they're going to do. They're going to go over there and they'll, they'll do all this unique thing that they tried to do. And yeah, some people were saved and kind of this. And then, you know, the, the they'll rip it apart in the 60 minutes. I already know. I can already see that we, 60 we've minutes. We've weaponized a death count. We've weaponized the death. I mean, have we ever done that with the flu? I mean, you know, the death toll coming up. And there's all kinds of reports coming out that people are not dying of coronavirus. Uh, you know, they're dying with it. In other words, if you're a terminally ill patient and you happen to test positive, they're saying you died of it even if it didn't kill you. There's all kinds of different things like that. They can do all kinds of things that were, are within the realm that they're counting differently than the flu. These are reports Peter Hitchens and other have reported on this happening in yep. the UK. I don't have the reports. In the actually, United we States. have it up on RegWatch. We've got uh, okay. a couple of stories cur curated up there. Sure. Uh, actually, early on, there was a study out of Italy that said 99% of all the fatalities all had pre, -con pre existing conditions. They only found like two or three people that didn't have the pre existing. But let me leave you the words of Al Gore. He was on TV a couple of years ago when the latest UN climate report came out. And he actually said it was to Chris Wallace, of course, the latest UN report has, tor has torqued up. How else do you get the attention of policymakers? And we have that in our movie. But there's Al Gore basically calling the science of climate change by the, presented by the United Nations as, quote, torqued up in order to get the attention of policymakers. So you know they're going to use some level of torquing up the stats here to, to create that fear in order to get the attention of policymakers so they can essentially be important people on some level. Now, I'm not saying they're not concerned about public health saving lives, and there's a lot of good work that they need to do, and they need to figure this out, everything from what's effective to quarantines to vaccinations to treatments. And I'm not dispelling that. I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm very worried about this virus. I mean, it's a nasty, virulent virus, but to see what it's done to America, you know, they, they, they said this is the, you know, this is your, the, the cure has been successful, but the patient is dead. That's what I'm worried about. And the patient being freedom, liberty, an economy, and an American way of life and a way of life just that humans deserve, the dignity of being free. This can be abused by governments. If the 20th century has taught us nothing, it is that. And just beware of the government because they are the greatest. Uh, killer of mankind in the history of the planet. Essentially, they are—they have been there. This is the dangerous precedent we've set, and I want to see President Trump recover. President Trump can lead the world. 
against this the same way he did against the UN Paris Agreement and against climate change. So let's hope that he follows soon. Well, that's good. So we 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 almost rescued the hope there. So Mark, just stay yeah. uh, right on the line uh, here for me when I just close out. And thanks again uh, terribly much. Thank you very much for coming Thank on. You. And that is it for this edition of RegWatch. And before you head off, please go to support.regulatorwatch.com. That's support.regulatorwatch.com. Consider making a financial contribution to our coverage. It's easy. Just dig into your wallet and find a few dollars and toss them our way. You'll be happy you did, and so will we. And while online, don't forget to like us on Facebook. And please do follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.